This is Reimagining Higher Education, your go-to podcast with remarkable education leaders sharing personal stories from their experience in and around the sector, including reflection and hope for progress in the sector. With your host, Professor Judith Sachs, former PVC Learning and Teaching at the University of Sydney, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost at Macquarie University, and Special Advisor in Higher Education at KPMG, and now Chief Academic Officer at Studiosity. Welcome. I'd like to introduce everybody to uh, Professor Cheryl de la Rey, Vice-Chancellor of uh, the University of Canterbury and prior to that, Vice-Chancellor of Pretoria University. But tell me about Cheryl. Oh, <laughs> Well, um, I've spent my most of my career in education. Uh, in fact, all of it, starting out for one year as a, a teacher in a high school um, and then moving on into a university environment um, in a department of psychology. So I'm a vice chancellor who's come up through the ranks all the way from um, a junior lecturer um, to you know, Deputy Vice Chancellor, which I did for six years, I then stepped out and worked for the National Research Foundation for about two years. I uh, headed up the um, Council on Higher Education in South Africa for an, another two year period. But so all of it has been in, in tertiary education or higher education as mm -hmm. it's called in some jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a remarkable career. So can you show me the object that I invited you to bring that tells the story of, of you as a, an educator and as a leader? Yes, it's, um, it's, it's going to perhaps not look as interesting as you might expect, but it's, oh, it's, the, it's the title page of my doctoral thesis. And um, the reason I brought it is that the doctoral thesis uh, was called career narratives of women professors in South Africa. And, you know, I did it as, um, I was an academic at the time, but of course, a very young academic or relatively young academic. And um, at the time I did this doctoral thesis, there was a prevailing discourse uh, about women's advancement and the advancement of women. In fact, it was termed uh, advancement of women. And there were many courses on offer uh, for the professional development of women. And I had participated in at least one of them. But I began to think that uh, all of these courses had something in common. And what they had in common was the assumption that women needed to um, advance their skills in order to participate more fully in all tiers of universities. And it seems somewhat of a deficit-based model. Uh, so at the time I became interested in looking at women who, albeit there were very few of them, who had seemed to have risen through the ranks. And I wanted to uncover what was different about them. Um, had they gone through any of these, you know, development programs, uh, and if they had not, why not? And you know, what what factors shaped their success or apparent success? So I interviewed twenty five women who were in senior positions across universities in South Africa, and that was my thesis. Mm -hmm. So looking back. <laughs> um, I would say that it's a case of probably on becoming the subject, uh, because now I'm one of the women that I would have sought to have interviewed. Yeah. Right. And when you think back on what you found out all those years ago and the sort of the lived experience that you have now, what, what are some continuities, what are some discontinuities and what are some great fractures that really you think oh my god we haven't changed much <laughs> well I think we've come a long way from the time when I did those interviews and the, there have been significant changes in awareness um, that gender equity matters 
There have been significant changes in policies, both at the national level, there have been changes in policies at institutional level, and certainly societal expectations have, have changed. And some of the more blatant examples of discrimination that were prevalent at that point in time have disappeared. Um, what has continued, however, are often what's described as the kind of micropolitics of discrimination or the more subtle and nuanced forms of discrimination, but definitely continuities in that. So yes, we've come a long way, uh, but there's still a long way to go. And as an example of that, uh, when I was appointed as vice chancellor at the University of Pretoria, it was, um, it had just ce celebrated its centenary. I was the first woman to be appointed in that position. And at the University of Canterbury, this year we're celebrating our 150th anniversary, and I'm the first woman to hold this position. So um, it's both. We've, we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. So what was your experience of being an undergraduate like, and then your experience of being a uh, doctoral student postgraduate? Um, being an undergraduate at um, at the universe at the university where I was was I would describe as um, one of the most um, formative experiences in my life. Formative in the sense that it opened up a new world of ideas, um, and I encountered uh, both through reading through engagement with uh, student clubs and societies, through the lectures, uh, a whole different way of thinking, thinking about the world and thinking about my place in the world. Um, it was a very um, dynamic time in South African history. I was an undergraduate student in the 1980s. Uh, it was a time where the apartheid government was uh, more ferocious than ever before <laughs> in, in terms of how it implemented racial discrimination. But at the same time, the opposition to apartheid had um, grown nationally, but also across the world. So it was a very dynamic time. It was a time where um, both the world in general and locally in South Africa there was a great deal of social critique, opportunities to engage in activism and to think about new ways of, of, of being uh, at a country level, but new ways of doing things from, from you know, a number of perspectives, including ethnicity, race and gender. And, and were you radicalized during this time? I wouldn't describe it as radicalized at all. Um, I think radicalized is kind of an emotive word, mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly opened up my thinking through um, reading a wider range of literature about different ways of doing things. I encountered um, much of the feminist literature for the first time. And when I was an undergraduate student, South Africa had still the list of banned books <laughs> that we were not allowed to read. And I remember being a student at university, there were some books that were on the list that were not freely available. But if you could demonstrate that as a student, you needed it for your educational or research purposes, you could get permission from the library to sit in the uppermost room uh, in the tower building all by yourself uh, under some supervision, looking at these books that were on the band list. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's an extraordinary story. And, and your postgraduate studies, we, did you have a supervisor that um, inspired you and that you, know, you connected with your other postgraduate students? What was that like, your, your well, postgraduate? Um, there are two parts to it. The first part is that, um, after entering university as an undergraduate and not being clear about what career pathway I was going to follow because my family at 
because I had done so well at school and I was first in family to go to university, um, he had hoped that I would go into becoming a medical doctor, as <laughs> is the case often. There's, you know, nothing unique about that. Uh, but I, it didn't appeal to me at all. I entered undergraduate studies, um, not being clear. So I enrolled initially for a combination of a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts. And um, after the first few weeks, switched entirely to a Bachelor of Arts, still not being clear about what my majors were going to be. And I didn't have any notion of what psychology really was, <laughs> um, but did it because it fitted my timetable and for some other reasons that not entirely rational. Uh, and then discovered that I did really well in it and continued. Um, and after concluding my first degree, my plan was to do a, a teaching diploma, a postgraduate teaching diploma, and then go on to, to be a teacher. Because I, in my extended family, there were people involved in education. Um, and I remember getting a call from one of the professors in the department uh, during the summer holidays saying, why haven't you applied to do the honors degree in psychology? And I said, well, I, this is what I was planning to do. And they said, well, you're one of our top students. We would really like you to continue with psychology and we will give you a scholarship to do so. And then I said, well, you know, I think the deadline has passed. And they said, you are a top student. Um, we would welcome you into the program. And so that's how I continued with psychology. So it took somebody um, who happened to be a woman professor <laughs> to mm -hmm. call me personally to persuade me to continue. And I continued. Um, I, I, I left um, that particular university after graduating with a master's degree and still uh, uncertain and not being clear except to know that I wanted to do some teaching and I went sign up for a high school, um, mm -hmm. as a high school teacher. And it was only when I was already in an academic job that I decided that I would do a doctoral degree. So I did my doctoral degree while I was fully employed as an academic, as a lecturer. Um, and um, doing the doctoral degree convinced me that uh, an academic career was absolutely right. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoy doing the doctorate. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I, I did a better piece of work because I was more mature when I did it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my postgraduate studies. So what's been important to you uh, as an educator? Because you've, you've, you've talked about um, the the support of a senior woman you've talked about um thinking about things that you hadn't thought about and then doing research that was important so what what else has been important to you both as an educator but also in uh, senior roles in universities well it's quite simple what drives me is my absolute belief in the transformative power of education it it, it opened a new world for me um and I don't mean that only in the economic sense, which is often measured, you know, the, the, there's a whole batch of studies on, on the economic benefits um, of, of university education, but it's the, the social benefit um, and the intellectual benefit and um, the personal benefits one gets from a, a, the opportunity to be in a university. Um, so the power of education to change people at the individual level, at the collective level, and the power of education to make intergenerational um, change in, a, in terms of positive outcomes, I, I am absolutely convinced about it and always have been. And that's what drives me. Um, in, in the various leadership roles I've had, and it will continue to be uh, something that, 
that um, inspires me and drives me in whatever I do. And I've seen it just repeatedly in societies, how powerful it is to um, reshape the way people think about themselves and in their place in the world. Can you give some specific examples of some of those ideas that you were just talking to, talking to me about? Well, the first is, um, I'll give you an example of something we're doing here at the University of Canterbury. Uh, and builds on, on my previous experience in South Africa. So in coming into a new country, I um, happened to come in at a time where the, the government has been or was looking at uh, a 10 year data set to look at educational outcomes for a Maori and a students of Pacific descent. And what they found is over a decade, despite many well-intended initiatives, there had been no shift in closing ethnic educational attainment gaps uh, between those groups. Um, so that is between people of European descent, Maori, and people of young people of Pacific descent. And um, New Zealand has a population of 5 million people. Um, I believe it's entirely possible on an evidence basis to shift those figures and to change that gap between ethnicity. And we've started a system, what I would call a system-wide shift. By system, I mean changing the way we do things at the University of Canterbury. And it's still early days, but we're seeing shifts in a positive direction where the educational outcomes between the ethnic groups are, is closing or is narrowing uh, in, a, in quite a short space of time. Because I think one of the things we, we have to grapple with is that um, universities, especially older institutions, like the ones I've worked in, you become accustomed to doing things in, in a particular way. And it, it, it's worked well for well, more than 100 years. But when you, you take on a more serious commitment and a more intentional commitment to having a more diverse um, student cohort, doing things the way you've always done it and thinking that there's a deficit in the students is gonna shift it, it's, it's insufficient. Um, mm -hmm. It's about a, a kind of institution-wide shift. Um, and that's what I'm working with, um, working on at the moment I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about what what you're doing because it sounds as though COVID was one of the great um, game changers in higher education around the world in terms of putting stuff online but you're talking about something that is much more joined and has a different sort of social impact and social outcomes can you talk to me about that a bit more yes well you know if you look at the the 20th century university um, by and large, we've been organized um, by disciplines and faculties. Um, and the, there's often um, in the organizational cultures, the, the staff will talk about the center versus the faculty. Um, and the challenge for us is that if we are serious about transforming educational outcomes, it's making sure we work in a coordinated way. Um, otherwise, we will do, there'll be small changes on a very small scale, but for an institution to see a shift, you need an institution-wide coordinated effort. And yes, we do need to consider and to continue to consider how do we um, develop growth mindsets in students? Uh, do, do we have tutors? Do we have mentors? All of that's important. But we've also got to look at the way we've always done things. And COVID is a fine example because most universities like um, ourselves that have uh, been, generally speaking, relied on lecture, the lecture hall as the way of teaching, we were thrust into a rapid change to online. But looking back, that rapid change, um, 
we we learned a lot from it and it's how do we take those lessons and and translate them into new ways of doing things so what we're focusing on is what we call blended and creating more flexibility in the way we deliver our education so how do we use the technology to give the student more flexibility and also as numbers grow or enrollments grow, how do we use the technology to also ensure that there's personal connection uh, and cohort development across the students? Because we also know that one of the issues that all universities or all young people in particular are grappling with are mental health issues. Um, and despite the fact that universities are busy places, lots of young people, many opportunities to enroll in student clubs and societies, they often feel quite lonely. They often feel isolated. Um, and interestingly, early on in their first year, many school leavers, students who come directly out of school, start questioning their own confidence. You know, am I up to it? <laughs> we, we know all of that. And that mm -hmm. requires us to think um, differently about our systems um, and you know even some of the, the terminology we use uh, and we take for granted if you're first in family coming to a university that's completely new <laughs> mm. um, and the whole concepts that again we talk as if everybody understands us we, we just know it as if we're serious about transformation if we're serious about diversity uh, and diversity in all its manifestations diversity of ability um, the diversity of culture ethnicity uh, and the full range we we have to and then there's a generational issue uh, mm -hmm. most of our academics are of, of a certain generation <laughs> uh, and we need to bridge those gaps and mm -hmm. change is about everybody buying into the change process and not some people uh, feeling that they have to, you know, fill up their skills gaps in order to meet expectations that have been around for 150 years. And that was the point of my PhD, trying to think about why is it that there are all these programs for the advancement of women um, you know, and I actually have written about this academically because the expectation was that in order to be a leader in universities, you kind of had to live up to expectations that were shaped by a certain set of assumptions that were really masculine assumptions. Um, hmm. um, you know, I remember being curious as to these workshops on voice training. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think I'm... I'm so not sounding yeah. shrill and things like that. Yes, yes. Right. Certainly in, in, in the 90s, you would have found quite a lot of that on offer. And if you walked into any bookstore and you looked at the kind of popular management books, there were a whole slate of them about women's advancement and how you should dress and how you should speak. Uh, <laughs> and much of that was framed by a particular perception of what a good leader is, um, which, you know, both conscious and subconscious. So you've had the unique experience of being a vice chancellor in South Africa, in Pretoria University, which is one of the oldest ones, but also an Afrikaans university and coming to New Zealand. What, talk to me about that transition from South Africa to New Zealand, but also being an educator in South Africa and New Zealand. In many ways, the, the, oh, there's a great deal of similarity. And the, at, the, at the highest level, the similarity is in, in the history of both places having been former British colonies. Um, mm -hmm. So the university and the education system, including the legal systems, have been shaped by that heritage. Um, and yes, there have been changes in each country. But the, the broad structure of the degrees, how the university calendar works, great deal of similarity. Um, academic ranking, you know, 
how one moves through the ranks, um, all of that's quite similar. Uh, another level of similarity that uh, I found was around um, who participates in, in university education. And the data that I spoke about in New Zealand, in some ways, mapped onto some of the, the patterns in the South African um, situation about universities have traditionally catered for the more affluent in society, the participation of those who didn't have a parent who had gone to higher education is much lower. So a great deal of similarity there. And in fact, in many countries, you would find something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, but also cultural differences. Um, so um, the relationship in a smaller island nation, the relationship between the university and government is a lot closer and more intimate. Um, and you have, or at least I have, one works closely with the minister and the officials. Um, there are only eight universities, so it makes us a tighter community um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in many ways, with South Africa being... A, you know, big population of now it's about 60 million. So that was a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, South Africans, I think, are very direct in communication, um, <laughs> where, whereas I discovered that Kiwis are a lot more polite uh, and really not direct at all. <laughs> so... Indeed. Yes. So that cultural adaptation <laughs> and then learning about the history of New Zealand and particularly learning about the historical relationship between uh, the Crown and uh, the, 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 the Maori people, uh, which, um, you know, we, we talk about um, the Treaty of Waitangi and what does that mean in, in the present time. Uh, New Zealand has had, the, the, the various Maori tribes have had claims against the crown and there have been settlements and understanding my new environment and um, it, both its history and what it means in the present and in thinking about the future. So in reimagining higher education, where are you in that journey? And what do you want what 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 do you want to achieve during your tenure as VC? Well, to show firmly and to completely debunk the myth that universities are ivory towers, that <laughs> um, that universities are enmeshed in the communities in which they're located. But not only are they uh, an integral part. So, for example, we've just had a community impact uh, report done independently, which shows that um, we're the second largest employer in the city of Christchurch. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just one statistic. If you think about the multiplier effect of the goods and services we procure, we uh, play a significant role in, in, in the economy uh, of, of, of this place and the, the city, and it's the second largest city in New Zealand. So we clearly have, are playing an important role, but I think we're not fully actualizing the, the possibilities of our institution, but as I said, the transformative power of our offering as an educational institution. So opening up opportunities to a diverse range of talent because, um, you know, talent is not distributed by ethnicity uh, or um, how much the, fam the household earns, um, but making sure that we become a lot more evidence-driven in how we do things, that we monitor our performance, we track it, and that we communicate it to um, truly debunk some long-standing myths about universities and their relationship to local communities uh, and the societies um, you know, that they're part of. 
I've got two more questions. One is to return to students. Um, if you could change something for students right now, what, what would that be? Um, to assist students in believing in themselves. Um, the, too many of our students, um, when they share their experience, especially that first year of being in a university, and it doesn't have to be a first year of undergraduate studies, um, it, it can be their first experience of a university, go through what is broadly described as an imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a great inhibitor of uh, for them actualizing what they're capable of. Um, so how to, I, I referred earlier on to, to be, how to assist them in developing a growth mindset mm -hmm. and believing in themselves and believing in their ability. And I often say to students, we, we have chosen you to be one of our students. And we have chosen you because we believe you're going to graduate. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, if we didn't believe that, we wouldn't have chosen you. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying that because many of the students, after the first, by the time they reach the towards the end of the first quarter, they're often doubting whether this is for them. Um, and that contributes to... Um, what I referred to earlier on is, is some of the, the mental health issues that many of our young people are experiencing right now across the board. So what uh, advice would you give to, the young, to your younger self? Um, I think to, to second guess myself less um, and to to take take a few more risks, um, I think those would be in, in what way academic risks, intellectual risks. Yes, okay. academic and intellectual risks. That um, you don't know what you're capable of until you really try and move out of your comfort zone. Uh, when you move out of your comfort zone, you discover that you're capable of more than you might have thought you are. And sometimes your, your biggest failures, or I'm sure many people say this, if you reflect on them, you, you derive your greatest learning from them. Um, mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to fail. Uh, one failure is exactly that. It's one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, over a lifespan, the peaks and valleys and enjoy enjoy both as much as you can that's a wonderfully optimistic way to end our conversation cheryl thank you for um beginning my day in such a uh, inspiring and uh, interesting yeah. way and um i hope that our paths cross sometimes so thank I you hope for so sharing too. thank you i you know education is absolutely a business about optimism <laughs> It is, it is. It's yeah. fundamentally about optimism, uh, about changing the future. So, Well, I'll let you go and change the future today. Thank you. Visit studiosity.com slash students first for the next Students First Symposium, an open forum for faculty, staff and academics to candidly discuss and progress the issues that matter most in higher education.